Hey there. In this video and the next few, we're going to take a look at regression. And I want to put this out there first that we're really not going to take a very scientific look at regression. We're going to much, use a much more sort of common sense approach and just try to understand the basic concepts. If you're really interested in sort of diving deep into the mathematics behind regression, you can crack a textbook open, but you know, we're just going to sort of look at the overview and really try to understand what regression is all about. So we're, in this video, we're going to start with simple linear regression. And let me quickly define what that is. Um, simple linear regression allows us to predict a linear relationship between two variables. Don't worry about that for a second. Let's just talk about the words in there. Simple means, we call it simple because we're dealing with two variables, and so we're trying to predict the relationship between two variables. Um, there could also be multiple regression, which we're going to get to in, in subsequent videos, which is multiple variables and their relationship to a single variable. And then we, it, we, we categorize this as linear regression because there are other types of predictive relationships. We're assuming there is a linear relationship between these two variables. In other words, when one variable goes up by a certain amount, the other variable is likely is going to go up or go down by a predictable amount in a linear form. So maybe 3x or negative 2.5x. That's going to be our y variable according to which, you know, one change in x we have, you know, 10x, you know, uh, a change of 10y, uh, 10, uh, sorry, a change of, of 10 to y. So it's really, um, it, it's, we're, we're expecting a linear relationship as opposed to, say, an exponential relationship. And so what do we use simple linear regression for? Well, when we suspect a linear relationship, it allows us to quantify that relationship. So typically we sort of say, I, we think there's a relationship between these two variables, but we don't exactly know what the, you know, the, the numbers behind that relationship are. And so simple linear reg regression allows us to actually put some numbers behind that prediction. It actually gives us a function that will allow us to predict one variable from the other. So if I have two events, typically we'll have two events, x and y. We'll call x are independent. Or our predictor variable. And y will be our dependent variable. And we call them the independent and dependent variables, typically, typically because what we want to do is we want to take a value of x and predict a value of y based on that value of x. And our linear regression will allow us to do that. It'll, you know, it's not going to be a perfect prediction, but it's going to give us an approximate value of y from our value of x based on this relationship. So we call x our independent or our predictor variable because that's what we're going to sort of plug into the function and it'll give us a value for y. Um, the truth is in, simil in simple linear regression, these relationships are basically interchangeable. So um, I could give you, you, we'll get an equation such that you could take a value of x and come out with a value of y or take about what value of y, plug it into the equation, just the reverse of the equation and it'll give you uh, a value of x. So in simple linear regression they're interchangeable but these are useful terms to start using now because when we get into multiple regression we're going to have several independent predictor variables and still just one dependent variable and we're very much going to use those predictor variables to come up with one prediction for the value of y. So I realize I'm, I'm doing a lot of talking but let's talk through some examples real quick. Um, an example of where we might use linear, simple linear regression would be um, taking a look at the relationship between gas prices and hybrid car sales. You know, I think everyone can sort of predict, oh yeah, you're going to have sort of a positive relationship there um, where gas prices go up and the sales of hybrid cars go up as well. Um, or the, sum, the, the how summer temperatures relate to a city's power consumption. Similar co concept there. Or how um, what, what the relationship is between social media mentions for an event and ticket sales for that same event. You know, again, so we're using, we're, we're talking about a predictor relationship. So we might be interested in saying, look, we've looked at all these past events and according to the number of social media mentions, that sort of, that helps us to predict a, a, the number of ticket sales and it's basically a linear, something like a linear relationship. We want to know what that relationship is. So if, when we see the next count of social media mentions, we're going to be able to say, we predict this many ticket sales. So I want you to notice something about both of those, or about all three of those examples that I just mentioned. First off, um, these are not exact predictions. Even if you have a whole lot of data, you're never going to be able to exactly predict 
what a city's power consumption is going to be based on the Fahrenheit for that day. It, there's, there's other factors, and this is just not going to be an exact science. But what we can do is we can get a, a, a good estimator, and that's really what we're shooting for. So we're really never going to be dealing with, I mean, in practical terms, we're, we're not going to be dealing with uh, a perfect correlation. We're not going to have a correlation of one, and we're not going to have a correlation of negative one. Um, we're really you know, coming up with an estimate in, in just about every circumstance. The other thing that I want to point out here, and you might not remember this when I was giving these examples a minute ago, but um, where I, I was very careful with my language. I did not say how gas prices affect hybrid car sales. I said, what's the relationship between them? And I'm probably, I'll probably end up belaboring this point, but basically when you're dealing with regression, you don't, you're not actually proving causation. You're just showing a relationship. And I promised I'd be practically here. A lot of the times you are going to, just common sense is going to tell you there is a predictive relationship. There is causation. You know, one event happens first, the second event, uh, the, the other event happens later. And so you can sort of say this one predicted this other event. But, you know, when we're talking about it from a mathematical perspective, especially, we don't like to go down that road because it is it's actually surprisingly tricky to prove causation. Um, and so you know, we, we, we try to be cautious and say, we just need the, the relationship between them. So, for example, and actually, you know, I just want to give a quick example because I think it, it illustrates how sort of perilous the idea of causation can be. If I said social media mentions actually drive ticket sales, there might be a relationship between those two items, but you might actually, so you might have something, you might have predicted something like this. Well, A which we'll call um, social media mentions, drives B. But what if it was something else? What if there was a C in there and it wasn't part of our regression equation? What if it, there was a marketing spend, right? The amount of money that's spent to promote this event, what if that actually affects both social media mentions and ticket sales? That would make a whole lot of sense too. And if we didn't factor in marketing spend into our equation, we might get something that looks like this, and it'll tell us a relationship. It'll allow us to predict ticket sales based on just a read of our social media mentions, but it won't actually be really accurate in terms of the cause and effect if this is the true scenario here. So all that said, like I, as I've sort of been saying, even if you can't prove causation, doesn't mean that defining that relationship and making that prediction doesn't make, mean it's not valuable. You can still make predictions from one variable um, to the other. All right, so enough talk. Let's look at a real example here. Well, real, I, I made it myself, but here we have a scatter plot. It shows, um, it's, it, it's showing points and the y-axis is our dependent variable and our x-axis is our predictor variable, our independent variable. And this is how you'll typically see a regression done is you, the data would often form a scatter plot. You've got data representing points where you've got two variables represented in each of those points and so you could, you could scatter plot it. Um, these, I've just used these sort of generic terms here, but we might be talking about something like um, degrees Fahrenheit, and this would be a city's power consumption. So the independent variable, or the predictor variable is the, the, the temperature, and the dependent variable, the thing that we're predicting from the temperature, is the city's power consumption. Or we might have I just realized this looks like of, that's supposed to be degrees Fahrenheit. Just, okay. um, we might have the price of a product that we're trying to sell um, as the independent variable, and we might have um, the sales volume. Well, this, that doesn't really make sense in this case because we would expect actually negative relationships, something sloping down. But you know what I'm talking about. Bear with me. Anyways, each one of these points here would represent a combination. It would re represent um, a value that we've measured in the past because that's what we have to use to, to, to make um, a regression. We have to use you know, collected data, data that we've already collected. And so each one of these would represent probably something we've measured, like a, a day where we measured the Fahrenheit and the city's power consumption, for instance. And um, so each one of these little dots would represent both an X and a Y value price and sales volume that we've measured in the past. And what we do with regression, let's see if I do this effectively, 
is we try to fit a line to this data. And so we're basically trying to fit the best line that we can to this data. Yeah, that's pretty decent. You know. uh, the, the closest line that, that we can make, that this, this sort of an approximation, is we want it to run right through the data. And by the way, I think looking at this scatter plot, it's a pretty good representation. It's, it looks linear, roughly. It's not curving off or you know, wavy or anything. So fitting a, line, a line to it you know, actually makes some kind of sense. And the line that we've put through this data is always going to follow this type of equation. See, I've used all my, my colors now. I have to, well, I could, I could use purple. What the heck? It's always going to follow this equation. Y equals B0 plus B1 times X plus an error term. All right, so I'm going to run. My, my, my diagram is going to bleed all in with this equation. It's going to be a mess. Just deal with it. I don't know. Here's our dependent variable, obviously. Y is our dependent variable, and X is our um, independent variable. Those parts you already knew. Well, what's B0? Well, this is our constant. It's the Y-intercept. And this makes sense to you guys. You've all seen this equation before. This is just, you know, this is a two-dimensional uh, two coordinate plane. This is sort of, I don't know, geometry way back in eighth grade or something like that. It's, it, this value is here. And you could sort of, in, in regression, you might simplify it to say, well, if our x value was 0, this is how, what our y value we would expect it to be. So if we had, a, in this case, if we were talking about, I'm just going with my Fahrenheit versus power consumption. If we had 0 degrees Fahrenheit, we would still expect to use some power. That actually makes sense in this case. Um, our b1, this is our slope. And you can call slope, you can call it rise overrun. Effectively what it is, is it's the change in y over the change in x. I'm using this, this delta to, to um, you know, stand for change. So if you, our x value goes up by 1, how much is our y value going to go up? That's what the slope, the coefficient of the slope is. It says, well, that's what you expect for the change in y. It might be if our x goes up by 1, our y goes up by 1 half. Um, Obviously, in this situation, we're talking, you know, basically a big, well, it depends on the units we're using to measure power consumption, but probably something big. Um, but so far, this is just like the basic, you know, in linear uh, functions that you've seen uh, in geometry. This out here, I'm really not going to belabor this. This just represents the fact that this is, um, there's, this is the error term. It says this is not a perfect prediction. Heck, we just ran one line through all this data and not one single data point actually landed on the line. A couple of them came close, but essentially it doesn't, it doesn't work for any, it doesn't work perfectly for any of our data, and that's often going to be the case. It's still the best fit line through the data, or you know, as close as I could come to sort of eyeballing it, um, but it's not perfect because this is not perfect data, There's, it's, it's, and it's not a perfectly linear relationship. I mean, sorry, it's not a perfectly predictable relationship. It's not, it does not have a correlation of one or negative one. So uh, it's an error term. It shows the uncertainty or the inaccuracy uh, of this line as a predictor for all data. Um, so how do we get this equation? It's not just by looking at it and eyeballing it like I did. There's actually a mathematical way to do it. And, and I'm going to describe it really quickly. Um, and we're not going to look at an example in Excel or anything like that. Though it's not tremendously complicated. Essentially, what, what goes on is the, uh, the equation for the line is such that we minimize the square of the distances, the direct distance between each of these values and the line itself. Okay, let me simplify that a little bit. You can basically think of it this way. If you took these distances in, in their absolute terms, so we don't call this a negative distance, it's just you know, the, the, the absolute distance from here to here or from here to here, and we add all of them up between from every one of these points of data that we already have and the line. We try to get the minimum. We, we've set up our equation such that our line has the minimum of distances. That's the way you can really conceptualize it. It's a little bit funnier than that. Actually, instead of taking the absolute value of the distances, we take the square of the distances, which um, means that outliers, like a point up here, 
uh, have actually sort of a disproportionately large effect upon um, the way the line is tilted, <laughs> I should say. So, um, but that's basically it. We, we, we are, you know, you could do this using, you could actually create a regression equation using like solver in Excel, if that's a, if that's a function you've used before. Um, if you just were minimizing the sum of the squared dis differences between each of these data points in the line itself. So, and, and so essentially it's, it's the differences between the actual value at any given value, of, the actual value for y at any given value of x, and the predicted value of y at any value of x. What those are, we actually have a term in regression, and I don't know the extent that you might need to know this, but it's called residuals. A residual is the, the difference between the predicted value of y from the regression, regression equation at any given value of x, and the actual value of y at any given value of x. And so this is essentially what we're doing. I mean, you know, we've done this, we've put in this, this line, and we're using this equation up here to make predictions. So we can say something like, oh boy, let's see if I can do this well. And we'll use a brand new color, gray. If this is our x value here, we want to know, and, and there's no data that we've got so far for that specific x value. If I went up here, there's, there's no, well, actually, let's choose a point, like right here, where there really is no x, there's no point at that value of x. But we want to know what the y value will be. So we, we're saying, this is the temperature. We know what the temperature is predicted to be tomorrow. We've never seen data for that specific temperature. And we want to know how much power the city is likely to need. Hey, look how nicely that, that worked out. So this is our predicted value right here. This is our predicted value for power consumption based on that observed x value. And a residual would be when we say, okay, you know, we actually, you know, this is our predicted value for x where we have a data point and the actual value of y that was measured versus our predicted value of y. So we, we square all those residuals we add them all together and then we minimize that using, by, by playing with b0 and b1, our intercept and our slope, and when we get that uh, a minim minimized equation that gives us a minimum um, for that sum of squares difference, then we have our regression equation. Okay, so that was a lot of explanation, but it's one reason you might sometimes hear regression called sum of squared, sum of squares, it's because that's what you're doing. You're basically, you're putting a line in place, the equation for which minimizes the sum of squared differences between predicted and observed values. All right, enough, of, enough with sort of the, 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 the why of it. You, you understand what we're trying to do here. We're fitting a line to the data. That's, that's the long and the short of it. So um, one thing I want to point out here is that this is very much related to sampling, right? I mean, in sampling, what we do is we have, we, we've taken a, you know, a, a small group from the overall population, and we use the data that that group gives us to make predictions about the whole population. And that's kind of what's going on here. What we have is we have a group of data and we use it to make estimates on values within the entire population. We realize that the data in itself is not 100% accurately representative of the population, but we use it, we know it's imperfect, and we say it shows us, you know, there is this linear relationship between our independent and our dependent variables and so anytime we grab another piece of data out of the population, another x value, another uh, value for our observed value for our independent variable, we're going to use everything we know, we've, all the information we've gathered thus far to make a prediction for our dependent variable using that. So it's all sort of, it's very much related to sampling.